Hi folks, welcome to this last lecture installment in our eight-part series of lectures on New Testament Christology. I'm sad to see it coming to a close, um, but I'm excited to have this brief discussion with you now on, okay, we've talked about the last couple of hundred years of critical study of New Testament Christology. We've talked about the Jewish context of exclusivist monotheism and the messianic speculations, the angelology, etc. We've talked about the wider Greco-Roman context of philosophy and paganism. We've talked about um, Jesus' own Christology. We've talked about the origins of divine Christology, Pauline Christology, Gospels Christology. Now, many, many other things. Wouldn't it have been wonderful if we could have talked about Hebrews and Revelation and uh, First and Second Peter and James and Jude, etc. Many other things I would love to have talked about. This has been kind of a rushed overview and necessarily so. But in this last episode, I just want to stimulate you into some more thinking about some of these key, key issues as we round off this course. How do we get from the exclusivist Jewish monotheism of the Jewish tradition, there is only one divine being, to the formulations in 325 AD at Nicaea, which is really the Trinitarian formulation, that there is one God in three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit, equally divine, equally powerful. They are united in the Godhead, one God, but they are distinguishable by their persons. It's three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit, a dynamic Trinitarian interactive thing. Um, each person, Father, Son, and Spirit, defined in some sense by the other in relationship, but three persons with one nature, all divine, one, um, one essence, etc. That's Nicaea. And then with Chalcedon, a particular homing in on the Christological feature of that Trinitarian theology, the second person of the Trinity, unlike the first and third, as it were, and this is so complex, um, is the Son, who was God from God, light from light in an eternity past, with the Father and the Spirit, became incarnate in and as the one person, two-natured Jesus of Nazareth, fully divine, fully human, equal in Godhead and equal in humanity with us, not 50% God and 50% human, not 70% God and 30% human, 100% God, 100% human, that in all ways divine like the Father, of the same nature as the, the Father and the Spirit, and of the same nature with us in our humanity, and like us in every way except our sin, that's the Chalcedonian definition, the two natures and one person definition of Christ, which was particularly hammered out and formulated in 451 AD. How do we get from Jewish monotheism to that conception, like historically, philosophically, theologically, literally, how did that happen? What sense does it make? How do we make sense of this great number of years in which these developments took place and their theological force, etc. So we talked about how Jewish monotheism had various exalted messianic speculations and how Jesus of Nazareth seems particularly to have made use of some of those messianic speculations and in his own person and prayer and particularly actions to have pressed through them in somewhat unprecedented ways into what pointed toward a divine Christology, that he believed in one God, but believed that he was associated uniquely with that one God in ways which was true of no one before him and would never be true of anybody else, that believed that there was one God, but that believed that that one God was concentrated in his person and work and teaching and activity and was revealed in his person and work and activity in a way which was true of him in a way that was true and would never be true of anybody else. And the way in which in his death and resurrection and the poured out spirit, that divine Christology took hold among all the earliest disciples and came to textual expression in the 27 books of the New Testament. And thereafter, for the next couple of hundred years, there were debates about how, looking back at the New Testament, 
looking back at the person of Jesus, looking through both into the Jewish monotheism of the Old Testament scriptures, one holds together a fierce commitment to one God, one supreme source of reality, whilst affirming what the New Testament seems to want to affirm, that there is only one God, but Jesus himself is divine, and the Spirit that's been poured out is divine. They are truly God and revelatory of God. So that there's one God, but that God is manifest as the Father of the Son, and the Son is also God. And he's the Son of the Father, who's also God. And the Son pours out the Spirit, who is also God. Who's the Spirit of the Father and the Son, both of whom are also God. There's one God revealed through and in and as this Trinitarian dynamic of Father, Son, and Spirit. Not all of the Christians in the 2nd, 3rd, 4th, and 5th centuries saw it this way. Some of the Christians went the route of what we might say was holding on to the divinity of the Father, but saying that the Son and the Spirit were quite exalted, but not quite on the same level as the Father. They were, in fact, creatures of the Father. The Father was the creator. They were creatures. That is the Arian heresy. That is the Arian route. There's another way of doing it, which is to say that, well, there really is only one God, um, but there aren't three distinct persons. The one God simply reveals himself in different periods of history in different ways. He revealed himself as the Father in the Old Testament, but then that scrapped with. He revealed himself as the Son, and then after Pentecost, he revealed himself as the Spirit. That is what scholars call modalism. There is just one monistic being called God who, at different periods of history, reveals himself in different modes. Once as the Father, once as the Son, once as the Spirit, but never all three at the same time as one God, such that we'd need to speak of three persons consistent, subsisting, eternal persons, distinct and interactive. Not everyone saw it that way. And then some Christians were in danger of viewing God as, as, as composed, if you like, as such distinct persons, Father, Son, and Spirit, that it almost looked as though they were expounding a kind of tritheism, that the the origins and source and sustenance of the universe, that is God, the divine, was so uh, distributed among three personalities that really one couldn't say that there was a unified God source, divine source of the universe. They could, in principle, go in different ways. So this worked itself out in apocryphal gospels. This worked itself out in theological debates and discourses. This worked itself out in various Christian movements and what we now, with hindsight, after Nicaea and Chalcedon call heresies. But nevertheless, with Nicaea, it was thought that no, the Jewish monotheistic tradition is determinative, and the revelation of that monotheism in the Father, in the Son, and in the Spirit is determinative. It really is one divine source, and that divine source really is manifested and articulated best as a divine source that in reality is an eternal eternal, relational, self-giving, non-competitive interactivity of three eternal persons, Father, Son, and Spirit, such that, so they also thought, the source of all reality, and don't miss this as a pastoral point, is not a one omnipotent, alone, sovereign being, all by his monistic self, as it were, but that the ground, the sustenance, and the future of all of existence is determined, is sustained, was generated out of the interactive, loving, self-giving, non-competitive divine source of Trinitarian interactivity and relationship between Father, Son, and Spirit. The interactivity and non-competitive relational love between the three persons of the Trinity is the most fundamental truth about reality. That's what Nicaea is about. And what Chalcedon is about is saying, in order to affirm the second person of the Trinity now accurately, 
one has to speak clearly and unequivoc unequivocally about his full divinity. He's not kind of divine. He's not partly divine. He didn't have to slough off some of, his, some of his divinity, hold some of it back in order to become human. That is not a problem. He is fully divine. He was fully divine. He is fully divine. He will always be fully divine. But in order to affirm his full divinity, nor does one have to compromise on a full affirmation of his humanity. The divinity doesn't have to hold back in order for the humanity to be real humanity. Because it's a full divinity, it doesn't swallow up, challenge, compromise, or nullify the integrity of that humanity. It's full divinity and real humanity together forever at the heart of the universe. And that's not just a theoretical, philosophical uh, issue that the early church is solving. It's a way of saying that is the ultimate hope for all of reality. That God in his entire being, particularly in the case of the third person of the Trinity, will one day not have to draw back and not be in our midst not have to be fully divine and in our midst and therefore challenge, override, swallow up, or nullify our full humanity. But one day the third person of the Trinity, fully divine, will be gathered together with the fullness of our humanity in Christ in the new creation, and that spirit will be fully divine in us, and we will be most fully and truly human. And that will be patterned after the full divinity and humanity of Jesus. I so hope you've enjoyed these lectures. I hope you've enjoyed this course. I know that I have many blessings to you.